So our next presenter is Dick Warnicke. And uh, let me find him. So we're going to give you the fire hose approach today, this morning, and then we'll have a break and have a chance for discussion. And uh, I think what you just heard was a, a nice over, overview of the papers. Obviously, you're gonna, well, hopefully you'll get the papers, you'll get a feel for what's going on. I think that there are some important, uh, obviously the important con con uh, change in the context that Kelly represents, the active, the, the experience that we have um, in VAs are both critical to our understanding of the of what we can do in multi-level and what areas we need to inform in the future. So Marty did a great job of bringing those points out. Now we're going to hear from Richard Warnicke. He's a professor emeritus of sociology, epidemiology, and public administration at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He has conducted cancer control research with populations of color and low socioeconomic status since 1968. Currently, he is the co-principal investigator of the University of Illinois at Chicago Center for Population Health and Health Disparities, one of 10 centers, five funded by NCAI, and five by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Dr. Warnicke's continuing long-range vision is to test and establish interventions that address determinants of population health disparities by approaching them with multi-level and multidisciplinary population health strategies. And I think it was pointed out yesterday that the first morning we managed to get through without mentioning disparities or ethnic differences and their influences, and I think now we're, we're getting around to something we all realize is critically important in our understanding of our healthcare delivery, and we're very happy to have Dick um, and his experience uh, represented here today. Welcome, Dick. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, I, I want to begin by thanking my, the co-authors on this paper, uh, particularly Steve and uh, Sarah Gellard, who, uh, who really made a, lot, made a big difference in what came out in the paper. Um, I also want to thank the um, Quality Care Consortium, the, Met the Metropolitan Breast Cancer Task Force, and the Sinai Urban Health Institute from uh, who provided some of the data that I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, the purpose of this paper is to examine um, an example, really, of how multi-level analysis of local data can influence health policy intervention. And as I was listening to the two previous papers, um, I kept asking myself, well, that's a wonderful model for overall health, but how is that going to interact with the, particularly the agencies that are dealing with uh, the underserved? And so this may be an example of that, understanding how local context affects access and quality of service and how mobilization based on local data can change policy. Uh, this is a... a uh, picture of what's going on in Chicago in breast cancer, and it continues to today, although this goes through 2005. And I put that arrow there because uh, when we were doing the, the first CCOP evaluation and so forth, one of the things that was happening was that they were publishing the first trials of early cancer treatment and uh, minimal surgery and some of the other things that changed uh, breast cancer care. Uh, and there were also changes going on in the way in which cancer was detected. And in, in some senses, it represented a paradigm shift because in 1974, during the Betty Ford Happy Rockefeller meetings, there was a big blow up about whether or not you could treat breast cancer systemically. Now, I'm old enough to remember all that and actually to have attended those things, but it's still um, a very interesting thing because I think we're headed for another paradigm shift as we introduce genetics and risk measurements into both treatment and care. And so, again, we need, I think, to ask the question is how is that going to, it may affect population health. In fact, it may improve everybody's health, but will it affect the disparities, that is the differences, or will, like mammography, the disparities just persist because every, all the boats shot rise at the same level? So that's really what I'm concerned about. So when we started doing our research in this area, we, we began by looking at uh, the, the patterns of uh, late stage diagnosis and the predictors using the census and the Illinois State Cancer Registry. And what we found, not surprisingly, was that uh, African Americans um, were at risk for late stage diagnosis compared to non-Hispanic white women. And this occurred at any age overall, and that th there was a similar pattern for Hispanic women. We have enough Hispanic women, so, so we can get some estimates of that. Um, 
But when you introduce poverty, most of the effects of race disappear, except that there's an interaction between poverty and um, late stage diagnosis among young women of color, <coughs> where uh, they're more likely to get aggressive breast cancer and uh, more likely to present with late stage diagnosis. There's a poster, by the way, out there showing how we extended that to um, uh, six other cities and replicated the results. So this is the model we've been using, and um, this has caused my friends on the review committee quite a bit of consternation, and I'd like to uh, clarify some more about it. Uh, in that top box, there really should be two, two things. On the one side, there are policies, and on the other side, there are social conditions that some people have called fundamental causes, that no matter what you do, these things still crop up and cause disparities. Um, social context um, is the place where those uh, pro policies and programs and the <clears throat> uh, disparities or the causes of disparities meet uh, at, at the point of delivery. And this is usually in a social context like a community or something like that. Um, and so, so, and then finally you see outcomes at the biological or genetic or uh, some, some level at that point, patient level, maybe in risk behavior. So, um, then we looked at some indicators of access. This was, this was data, again, from the registry and the census tract. And we were looking for things that would cause disruption in neighborhoods, because there's a big literature that talks about disorderliness and problems in neighborhoods uh, affect health and also affect uh, cancer. And what we found was that women living in gentrified neighborhoods and women living in areas of high immigration uh, were both more likely those that lived through these processes were more, more likely to be at a late stage diagnosis than um, uh, women who lived in stable neighborhoods, even at the same socioeconomic level. And after we considered a bunch of things, we started with a hypothesis that this was stress related and that was the result, and we didn't find any indicators of stress. But we did find that uh, when these populations change, um, the the new populations often do not have eligibility for Medicaid and other things that pay for these uh, services. So the services moved or reduced their services quite a bit so that uh, it was loss of access, we think, that is the problem. We're studying now the safety net institutions to find out more about that. But that was what we th that's what we think. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about what we think and less about what we know. Um, Surveys of mammography services in the area that was done by the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force found that uh, there were some deficiencies. Non-Hispanic uh, African-American women were more likely than uh, non-Hispanic whites to be screened at non-academic facilities. And these facilities were less likely to have digital mammography, which is important for detecting cancers in young women with dense breasts. And women screened at these non-academic facilities were less likely to have their mammograms read by trained specialists. Um, we, we happened to have, uh, we interviewed about 900 newly diagnosed cancer patients using the rapid case ascertainment and the state cancer registry to, to do this. And we geocoded these people into areas that were medically underserved and designated. Other areas, which we happen to have in Chicago, that would be eligible for medical underservice but were never designated, and, that, and then areas that were general population. The state coded this for us. And um, when we did that, uh, we compared residents of MUAs with the general population, and they were more likely to present with late-stage diagnosis. But when we controlled for utilization of services and socio-demographic things, the residents of the MUAs looked their probability of late stage diagnosis was the same as in the population, general population. Whereas the residents of the undesignated areas, we could not erase the disparity. They continued to have a, a higher risk for late stage diagnosis, which suggests something about quality um, of, of the services that are available. So potential explanations are one that uh, with, the, with the neighborhoods that the access was limited before gentrification occurred. Uh, that's not the case because the areas that we looked at were areas that were designated as um, uh, medically, uh, medically underserved, so they had facilities. One of the things we noticed was that the areas that were designated had somewhere around 180 safety net facilities in those areas, whereas the areas that were undesignated had under 20. 
So we think that there's something about the ecology of safety net institutions in these undesignated areas that needs further exploration, and that's what we're doing. Um, access was adequate, but adequate was poor. As a second explanation, the initial assessment of quality indicated it was poor, but access to quality was not jointly assessed. Were not jointly assessed. That is, the access and quality were not jointly assessed. And finally, in the paper, we explore some biological explanations, which I won't go into here. So uh, the community uh, affected rates of late stage diagnosis. They formed a task force that was led by very influential uh, leaders in the healthcare community, uh, but was supported by a huge range of, of uh, different groups in the community. They uh, produced a report that produced legislation that removed some barriers and then, with help of, from um, Avon and Coleman, they established a quality consortium where they collected data on these four points that are, um, that are listed here um, from each of the um, safety net screening institutions in Chicago, including the Department of Public Health. The thing is that they didn't get, although about 70% agreed to provide this data, the provision was slow. The Illinois Department of Family Services, however, became aware of what the consortium was doing. And uh, so they changed their policy and said that they weren't going to reimburse providers who didn't provide this data to the quality consortium. So what that does is, I, I think to me, it, it points out the importance of having community stakeholders involved in these things. And the community stakeholders are not just the lady next door or the person down the street. They range from the very powerful people who have lots of influence and have lots of influence that we as investigators can't use. Um, so finally, my focus for discussion is, is it necessary for multi-level analysis to lead, a, to, lead to multi-level interventions? The quality forum is clearly an intervention. Uh, its effect could be measured at the healthcare organizational level and at the individual level, uh, whether or not it produces change. What they're doing is collecting the data and taking each reporting institution and sending them a report comparing their rates on those four items to uh, the general um, outcome. So they're, they're at least trying to get everybody on the same page. My, my question, I guess, for the, for the people that were talking about the high-level system is how are these uh, ACOs and, and other programs that are included in the, um, th this legislation, what is the way in which they're going to be linking to these community health centers that are going to be established and the other um, programs that are directed toward the uh, people who don't have uh, insurance, who don't go to these large-scale providers? Thank you very much. Excellent, Dick. Thank you for bringing up the issues and beginning to look at how you look from the bottom up um, at multi-level effects.